Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your kind welcome. It's a privilege to be with you again in Kelty and with all those who are far from Kelty, uh, not least the beautiful and wet island of Skye. So good to be with you tonight. Our eyes have been turned to the Lord, as, it, as the case should be. And I want for us tonight to be thinking about aspects of discipleship. We are called to be disciples. Paul writes a wonderful verse in 1 Corinthians 1, 9, when he says, God is faithful. And he has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that is the calling of every born again believer, every Christian. That's our calling to be in fellowship with him, to live with him, to walk with him, to learn from him, to engage in practical godly living in his presence and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's really the broad topic that I want us to consider throughout April, the Lord being willing. I'm going to turn to the first letter of Peter. Um, and we're going to read in chapter three, but just as we do that, let's just remind ourselves that Peter lived in the midst of trouble. So do we, of course. In fact, in our lifetime, probably most of us have never lived in a more troubled world than the world is today. Everywhere we turn, we see brokenness. We see evidence of cruelty and wickedness and godless, godlessness. And Peter lived in that kind of world as well, because the emperor of that day, Nero, was a singularly wicked man. So when this great letter was written, Peter was talking about things that were real experiences for him and for others. And in the letter, through the Holy Spirit, Peter is able to give some great principles for Christian discipleship, for godly living in a hostile world. And that's where we are as well. Tonight, in chapter 2, for example, at verse 13, he talks about how to be a Christian disciple, how to undertake godly living in a secular society. That's very relevant, isn't it? From verses 18 to 20, he talks about being a Christian, living a godly life under human masters in the workplace, if you like, in, secular, in the secular workplace. And that's an important issue as well. And in verses 21 through 25, he gives us wonderful examples of how the Lord himself dealt with these situations. And so it's clear what we have to learn. But as we go into chapter three, where I, I want us to spend some time, we find that there are two more very important settings where we are given the principles for godly living. And they're very personal in nature. From verses one through seven, it's about how to be a Christian disciple, how to be in fellowship with Christ in a, a marriage, in a Christian marriage. And that's certainly a very current issue. And then in verse 8, we are given principles for living a godly life in Christian fellowship, in the local assembly, in the local church, where we are members and where we spend a lot of time in fellowship with others. How to be a disciple there, how to live a godly life there. And that's very important, as important now as it ever was. And I think 
it's just realistic to say that if, you, if we look around, we can see that many church fellowships are not what they should be. They're not in a good shape. Some of them are marked by division. Some of them actually split. People leave. Some have become dysfunctional. And some have even disappeared. And complacency is not appropriate. Complacency is a danger. And it's this current concern that I want us to spend a wee while tonight considering. So this is First Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. Now, I want to read it to you. And I want to read it to you three times. It's a very short verse. I want to read it to you in three separate translations so that we get a rounded understanding of what God is really saying here. So it's 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, and this is the New International Version. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. The same verse in the ESV version. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. And thirdly, in the Amplified Version, which as I'm sure you know, takes words and sometimes attaches several English words to the original language in order to round out the meaning. So here's 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 8, according to the Amplified Version. Finally, all of you be like-minded united in spirit, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, courteous and compassionate toward each other as members of one household and humble in spirit. Well, that's the word of God and uh, we give thanks for it and we ask his blessing upon it as we consider it now with his help. Verse 8 begins with finally. Now that doesn't mean it's the end. It's far from the end actually. What the finally means is in summary, finally, summing all of what I've been saying up to here, summing up what has gone before. So it's a summation and we note that what is being said applies to all God's people. There are no exceptions. It applies to every Christian. It applies to everyone who names the name of Christ as Savior. And this summary is very personal, it's very individual, and it's very important. The godly character of the local church, the local fellowship in which we are, will never exceed the godly character of its members. So there is an individual responsibility here. So the topic tonight is how to live a godly life among God's people in our local fellowship, in the local assembly, the local church. So the question is, what kind of people should we be? Well, we're told in verse 8 that there are five characteristic attributes of the disciples of the Lord Jesus in fellowship. And these are, first of all, that they are like-minded, that they are sympathetic, that they are loving, that they are compassionate and they're humble. And these ideas, these fundamentals appeared in all three 
translations. There's no mistaking it. And tonight I want us just to focus on the first of them. Being like-minded. Well, we are to be like-minded. That's what the NIV said. That's how it expressed it. The ESV said we should have unity of mind. The Amplified said we need to be unified in spirit. Another translation says we are to be harmonious in mind. Another translation says we are to be bound together in union of thinking. When a difference occurs among us, when it becomes threatening, and it's a real presence in our fellowship, what, what should our response be? Well, it's perfectly clear that our first response is that we should be willing and even eager to seek agreement and harmony and reconciliation and peace. That's the path of discipleship. That's the first priority when difference of mind appears. I suppose we could say this, that um, those who are at peace with God should be at peace with each other. Certainly we must avoid the opposite. We must avoid being negative, being fault finding, being overly assertive in our views and our opinions, being eager to confront other people, being willing to participate in cliques. These are all the opposite of what is being implied here and being like-minded. Remember the Lord's words himself. He said this in Matthew 5. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. That's what God did. That's what God is like. He made peace with those who are not like-minded with him. Before we knew him in Christ, we were not at all like-minded with God. God's mind and God's will didn't mean a thing to us. And yet that's when Christ loved us and gave himself for us. And those who are his children, the children of God, they should be like their father. Those who walk in fellowship with Christ should be increasingly conformed into his image and be like him. It's what God does. Listen to the words of Ephesians 4. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit, to be like-minded in the spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort. However, we also need to remember that being like-minded is not the same as being identically minded with everyone in every detailed respect of everything. That is what cults do. That's an enforced, rigorous control of what you must believe about absolutely everything. That's not what's being talked about here at all. That's not what's being meant here by like-mindedness. For there is room for legitimate difference among Christians, among followers of the Lord Jesus. So long as these things are not fundamental to the principles of the gospel and to God's word, there, there can be in those non-fundamental cases some difference of opinion. But it is our underlying priority to make every effort to seek peace out of difference, make harmony out of disharmony. So in being like-minded, whose mind are we to be like? Am I to be 
like-minded with you? Have, have I to fall in with what you say? Or are you to fall in with, with what I say? No, we are to be like-minded with God. No question about it. That's what, fel that's what fellowship and discipleship means. That we seek to be like-minded, first of all, with God. We are to be willing to have our minds made like God's mind. Our will to be made like his will. And in the end, that relationship with God, that willingness to be like him, that takes priority over everything. And can I say this gently, even on occasion, takes priority over being like-minded with others. We begin to see this may not be as simple as it looks. It means being like-minded. It is not to be maintained at all and any cost. And we know that that is the case with God himself. He dealt with us when we were not like-minded with him. But that lack of like-mindedness, there was a terrific cost attached to that, to put that right. And it means sometimes that just as God had to stand upon his character, which is that of holiness, and exact the most awful penalty at the hands of the Lord Jesus himself, there is a moment when we have to stand too. And we have to stand on the fundamental truth of who God is of what God is like. And so the teaching becomes more profound the more we think into it. It must be with great reluctance and with respect, even when it causes disagreement, that there will be occasions when we say no. I, I, I can't go with that, I'm sorry. And the reason is that I can see quite clearly it's, it, it's not. It's not what God's like. It, it's not what his work's like. It's not what his will is like. We would never take that step lightly. But it's very important. You remember the incident that is recorded in Galatians chapter 2 when the Apostle Paul and the writer of this letter, the Apostle Peter, had a disagreement. They were not like-minded. And in Galatians 2, which of course was written by Paul, and when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, Paul says, because he stood condemned. And the subtext is because he was wrong. And what was it that made Peter wrong? Well, here it is, it's in verse 14 of the same chapter. When he saw, when Paul saw that their conduct, Peter's conduct and those that were with him was not in step with the truth of the gospel, that is the fundamental principles of the gospel. It must be defended. And it mustn't be overlooked. And we cannot just say for the sake of peace, we'll let that go. There are certain things that are too important for that. This is a huge principle. That the only safe foundation for godly like-mindedness in a fellowship is faithfulness to the revealed word of God. That's an enormous principle. And so it becomes imperative in our local fellowship that the word of God is given a very important place. People need to know the word of God if they are to heed it and obey it. And the word of God has to be rightly divided in the wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit. It has to be rightly interpreted in keeping with scripture as a whole and the power and the wisdom of the spirit 
And in our fellowships, it has to be clearly taught. And as necessary, it has to be soundly defended and faithfully obeyed. Now, can there be any doubt today that this is something we need to heed? You know, we look around us and we see at the wreckage of marriage, the breakup of the family, the role of parents, parenting. And we begin to realize there are principles there that flow directly from the word of God. And we need to stand firm on these things. We're in fellowship with Christ over these things. Can you imagine some of the things that would become important to the people who lived in Peter's day under an emperor like Nero? It clearly lays a great responsibility on the elders and church leadership to ensure that the Bible is taught in that way faithfully and according to the spirit. But the nature of godly like-mindedness, that is to say, the way we think together and share together, it must be a matter for us all. It's not something that should be imposed. It's something that should come from within us. We are all to be like-minded. We are all to be like-minded as God's people. But the practical point is this that we must know when to seek agreement and when to make a stand on principle. And so we have to heed God's word. We have to know it. It's such an important priority. And in our services, it must be taught. And as Christians, we must learn. There is a personal and individual responsibility on every one of us, as well as a whole fellowship, corporate one. As individuals, we must not depend entirely. Of course, we get assistance and guidance from people who have, are more experienced than we are, but we must not depend entirely on someone else to tell us. We don't, we don't take our, our thinking unthinkingly from what people say to us, not from Books, not even from Christian books that we may read. Not from the YouTube, wherever it may lead, lead us. Not from broad, broadcasts, not from anywhere. The place to learn about scripture is to be, have the book open and ask God to speak to us through it. The scripture, after all, was written for people like you and me. It was not in the first instance written for theologians. It was written for people like you and me and under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And of course, with the advice and guidance of people who are wiser than we are, we must make God's truth and God's will and God's way our own. We need to know what we believe and we need to know why we believe it. Remember Acts chapter 17. And uh, the gospel is being preached and the gospel is being blessed. And we read there in verse 11, now the Berean, the Bereans, these were Christian people who lived in Berea, who heard the gospel. Many of them were of a Jewish background. But Acts 17 says they were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. Why was that? Because they received the message with great eagerness. Well, that's very good, isn't it? And examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Now, that's, that's the hub of it. That's, that's the core. They're, they're examining the scriptures every day to be sure that they're not simply following somebody else's view of what God has to say. You couldn't have a more distinguished teacher than the Apostle Paul, really, could you? Apart from the Lord himself, 
But here they're being commended because they said, oh, well, we hear you, Paul. We hear what you're saying. But we'll go to the scriptures and we'll see what they say. That's a noble attitude of mind. They accepted the message. They accepted it eagerly. They had become Christians. And then they examined the scriptures. They didn't just read the scriptures. You know, there's a difference between reading and examining. We need to examine the scriptures, reflect on them, carry them about with us in our minds while we're driving our cars, but be careful. <laughs> but during the day at different times, his word should live there. And we reflect on it often, regularly, make it a part of our thinking and of our life. And why do we do that? To see the truth of God for ourselves. It's a mark of spiritual nobility. We are called to make God's truth expressed in scripture our own. And within the fellowship of local church, we are to encourage one another in the scripture, help one another towards that same understanding under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So godly like-mindedness is to be sought. It's to be held in God-given wisdom. It's such a beautiful thing. Let me just remind you of Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. When they have godly like-mindedness for their the Lord bestows his blessing even forevermore. That's a principle that never changes. A church fellowship that is not like-minded in God's truth, in God's word, in things of fundamental importance is a church that is not ready for blessing. But a church where there is a like-mindedness in God's truth a wholesomeness in it. That's the place where God's blessing dwells. Finally, all of you, to sum up, all of you, be like-minded. Each one of us should be minded like the blessed Lord himself. Let this mind be in you. And you will be blessed. And you will be like-minded with your similarly seeking brother and sister. May God help us to reflect upon his word and help us in the Christian fellowships where we worship and serve to be like-minded in the way that he would have us be. Amen. Let's just close in prayer. Our Father, we acknowledge before you tonight with your word before us that there is so much that we have to learn. And the place we can learn it is in your word. Help us to be people of your word. Help us to read your word. Help us to examine your word. Help us to obey your word. Give us the wisdom that we need to be faithful, obedient servants. To be good companions in the fellowship of Christ himself. Help us to be spiritually noble in relation to your word. We would ask this for every one of us. However long we may have been on the Christian pathway or however short, help us to love your word. Help us to make it part of who we are. So we ask your blessing tonight upon our gathering, and we give you thanks for all your love towards us, for that love which never fails. We return our thanks now in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.